Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of our digital festival to celebrate the 25th Women's Prize for Fiction. Uh, when we were setting up the prize, our aim was simple, which was to amplify and honour and celebrate amazing writing in English by women from all over the world, and to put the classics of tomorrow in the hands of the readers today. Well, we're certainly doing that um, on the second day of our festival. Yesterday, we had Hilary Mantel and Angie Cruz, Tomorrow, we're going to have Jenny Offal and Bernadine Evaristo. And on Wednesday, the 25th, you know, the Women's Prize for Fiction will be announced. But we're delighted to be doing it in this way because I'm seeing already um, people from all over the world, from Johannesburg, from Dubai, from New Zealand. And those of you who were with us last night, welcome back. And those of you who are joining tonight, you'll learn how we're doing it. Our aim was absolutely that you could all take part in this uh, because it's a fantastic shortlist for the 25th year. Now, there are other ways that you can get involved with the prize at the moment. We're doing a Reading Women campaign, which is our 24 previous winners. And you can read them all. I mean, obviously, beg, borrow, steal, or buy them all. Um, and then say the one that means the most to you. And you can go onto our website. All the details will be in the pop-up boxes and vote. Of course, we're going to keep the vote open till November or so, because we need the 25th winner to be in there, because otherwise it just wouldn't be fair. Um, you can also, if you go onto our website, see our podcast where a new generation of readers, some of whom were not even born when the first winners of the Women's Prize were announced, are talking about what they feel about the books and their inspirations. And there's lots of tips as well about writing as well as reading. And of course, the final thing for the 25th year is our very first Women's Prize for Fiction publication, our Women's Prize journal. And you could get a first edition of that if you want to. Lots of space for your own notes. Those of you who were here last night will have heard me say, this is when your novel starts. You buy the Women's Prize Journal, there's loads of space, and you start writing your own novel. And then in a few years' time, you can be up here on the screen, and that would be fantastic. Uh, we're publishing it with Unbound. Uh, so if you go on their website, and again, the details will appear in the box, you can be part of that first edition, which would be fantastic. But tonight, we have two of the brilliant uh, shortlisted authors for this year's Women's Prize for Fiction, Maggie O'Farrell and Natalie Haynes. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hear readings from each of their novels, Hamlet and A Thousand Ships. Then there'll be a short film from each of the authors. Then we'll be chatting as if you weren't there. I can see there's hundreds of you, but just, you know, we're going to chat as if you weren't there. And then we'll take a Q&A uh, from your questions. You can either put those in the chat box or the Q&A box. And wonderful Women's Prize for Fiction people will curate those and send them through to me. We will do as many as we can of the questions, but last night we were overwhelmed, um, so we'll get through as many as we can. So please don't be too sad if it's not your name that's called out. So uh, to get us off for this evening, uh, first is Maggie O'Farrell. Uh, she's written eight novels. She's the winner of the Betty Trask Award, the Boston Novel Award, the Somerset Maughan Award, and she's also written one memoir, I Am, I Am, I Am. So reading from Hamnet is Indira Varma, who you'll know from the Canterbury Tales, Luther, and the Game of Thrones. So here is Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. Don't stand there gawping, his grandfather hisses. Help me. Hamnet shuffles forward a step, then another. He is wary his father's words circling his mind. Stay away from your grandfather when he is in one of his black humours. Be sure to stand clear of him. Stay well back, do you hear? His father had said this to him on his last visit when they had been helping unload a cart from the tannery. John, his grandfather, had dropped a bundle of skins into the mud and in a sudden fit of temper had hurled a paring knife at the yard wall. His father had taken Hamlet's face in both of his hands fingers curled in at the nape of his neck, his gaze steady and searching. He'll not touch your sisters, but it's you I worry for, he had muttered, his brow puckering. You know the humour I mean, don't you? Hamnet had nodded, but wanted the moment to be prolonged. 
for his father to keep holding his head like that. It gave him a sensation of lightness, of safety, of being entirely known and treasured. Swear to me, his father had said as they stood in the yard, his voice hoarse. Swear it. I need to know you'll be safe when I'm not here to see it. Hamnet believes he is keeping his word. He is well back. He is on the other side of the fireplace. His grandfather couldn't reach him here, even if he tried. His grandfather is draining his cup with one hand and shaking the drops off a sheet of paper with the other. Take this, he orders, holding out the page. Hamnet bends forward, not moving his feet, and takes it with the very tips of his fingers. His grandfather's eyes are slitted, watchful. His tongue pokes out of the side of his mouth. He sits in his chair, hunched, an old sad toad on a stone. And this? His grandfather holds out another paper. Quick as a fox, his grandfather makes a lunge. Everything happens so fast that afterwards Hamnet won't be sure in what sequence it all occurred. The page swings to the floor between them. His grandfather's hand seizes him by the wrist, then the elbow, hauling him forward into the gap, the space his father had told him to observe. And his other hand, which still holds the cup, is coming up fast. Hamnet is aware of streaks in his vision, red, orange, the colours of fire streaming in from the corner of his eye before he feels the pain. It is a sharp, clubbed, jabbing pain. The rim of the cup has struck him just below the eyebrow. That'll teach you, his grandfather is saying in a calm voice, to creep up on people. Well, I first heard about Hamlet the Boy almost 30 years ago when I was studying the play Hamlet for my Scottish hires, and my teacher mentioned in passing that Shakespeare had, had a son called Hamlet. And the connection between this lost boy who died at the age of 11 and probably Shakespeare's greatest play, arguably his greatest play, just never quite lost me. It's always intrigued me. You know, the fact that um, Shakespeare, for all his enormous output, what we actually know about him, his biography is pretty scant. You know, there are many, many gaps in it, despite the best efforts of brilliant scholars. Um, it just seems to me that calling your, you know, this play, your tragic hero and your play after your dead son is, is, an, is an enormous, um, there's an enormous depth to that. It's telling us a great deal. Well, researching for the novel um, was obviously, it was quite, a lot of it was book-based, you know, going back to the play, the plays, and also, you know, th there's no shortage of books about Shakespeare to be read. You could spend the rest of your life reading them if you wanted to. But I, I also did a bit of a more sort of hands-on research, actually, to try and get under the skin of these people who lived so long ago in a world that's so different to ours. And one of the things I did um, was to plant an Elizabethan physic garden or, or medicinal garden, um, as most houses would have had one. So I was kind of borrowing the motif of herbology from the play Hamlet um, and weaving it into my own book. So you can see behind me, this is the garden that I planted. I, I mean, I, I'm not really much of a gardener actually. But, uh, so I planted ladies' mantle and lavender and lemon verbena and sage and uh, rosemary, which would have been used, you know, for everyday medicines in a household. I also uh, learnt falconry. I learnt to fly a kestrel. I went to the Scottish borders and did that. That's probably the most fun thing I've ever done <laughs> in the name of work. I went mudlarking along the Thames uh, in Tudor dumps and I found uh, quite a lot of pipes, which of course you can find in the Thames all the time, sort of tobacco pipes that were smoked and thrown away. Um, I also found these um, Tudor pins, these brass Tudor pins. They look quite like the pins that we use in dressmaking, but they've got rounded tips and they would have been used uh, in hair to, to put up people's hair and also to keep their ruffs on. Um, and I also found, one of my favourite things which I found is this, which is a ship's glass, um, which uh, was built into the hold of a ship to refract light into the dark space below, below a ship. And that's, that sits on my kitchen window, you can see. Um, so yeah, it, it, was, it, it was quite fun. There was a lot of library, but also a lot of uh, put it getting in my hands dirty, literally. I mean, certainly I think the COVID pandemic has has changed the way I feel about the book um, you know when I wrote it particularly the chapter where in the middle where I trace the path of the Black Death all the way from Alexandria to Warwickshire you know when I wrote it it was just an act of research I remember trying to really 
imagine quite hard, I had to imagine quite hard what it would be like for this disease to be sweeping across continents towards you. And of course, now we know the infographics that I had up on my wall, you know, when I was writing that chapter two years ago, look, you know, oddly similar to the ones that we were all looking at in February and March. So it is strange. In a sense, I feel um, I'm able to imagine better in a way. I feel kind of closer to the Elizabethans and the terror and the fear they must have felt with this ever present disease that could fell a really healthy person in 24 hours. Writing the scene where Hamlet dies and is laid out, I think it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever written. Um, you know, it, it, one of the reasons I put off writing this book for so long is my own son, I couldn't write it until my own son was well past the age of 11. I kept thinking about writing it and then I would swerve away and write another book because I found that I couldn't do it. Not that there was a huge <laughs> risk of my son contracting the Black Death, but you never know, you can't be too careful about these things. And I, I was looking back in the diary actually recently um, for another reason and I, I found, I came across this completely blank double page and on it I'd written, I killed Hamlet today. Um, so I, I did have to write in quite sort of short bursts, maybe 15 or 20 minutes and I wrote them outside the house in the garden actually in a shed and it, it was a really horrible dilapidated old potting shed where I wrote for short bursts and I'd have a walk around the garden. You know I think what it comes down to for me actually is that I think such a large part of love is is a kind of is a fear of loss it's the kind of inverse of love you know obviously there's no greater nightmare there's no more visceral fear for any parent than the losing of a child of the idea that you would might have to bury a child there's, there's nothing worse I think. What a, a beautiful, beautiful film and amazing uh, reading from uh, Indira Vami. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sorry um, if you're getting a bit of problems with the films. Um, what we're trying to do is give you the authentic sense of the 16th century. We're taking you back in time, so it might have gone a bit wobbly, but um, hopefully it won't have gotten in the way of your enjoyment of that. So next up, we have Natalie Haynes, uh, who is the author of three novels and two works of nonfiction, including Pandora's Jar, Women in the Greek Myths, which is out in just a couple of weeks time, so you can order it now. Uh, she's recorded four series of Natalie Haynes Sounds Up for Classics for Radio 4, and in 2015, on the Classical Association Award. Reading from A Thousand Ships Now is Anne-Marie Duff, who you'll know as a BAFTA and Olivier Award uh, winning nominee. And she's been in Shameless, Notes on a Scandal, Suffragette, and of course, played St. Joan. Take it away. My dearest husband, can it really be ten long years since you sailed from Ithaca to join Agamemnon and the other Greek kings in their ignoble quest to bring Helen back from Troy? Was it a thousand ships which sailed in the end? That's what the bards sing now. A thousand ships, all sailing across the perilous oceans in hope of finding one man's wife. It remains, I'm sure you agree, an astonishing state of affairs. I don't blame you, Odysseus, of course I don't. I know you did your best to avoid leaving me, still a young bride, our son just a few months old. Playing dead might have worked a little better, perhaps, but playing mad was a good idea, too. I still remember that snotty Argolid's face when you ploughed the fields with salt. He thought you quite insane. In my recollection, you were pulling the most hideous faces, and the man looked at me with such Pity. A baby with a madman. No woman should endure such a fate. How close you came to dodging their draught. So close to staying with me. Leaving the other Greeks to indulge in their oath-bound folly. But of course, it would be Agamemnon who forced your hand. I will never forget him ordering his man to snatch Telemachus from my arms and place him on the damp ground in front of you testing your madness by endangering your son. Would you plough on regardless and slice right through him, right through the chubby limbs of your own child? Or would you see the infant, know him and stop? You will forgive me for saying that I'm not sure I have ever wished anyone dead with quite such enthusiasm as I did Agamemnon that day. And bear in mind that I grew up in Sparta, so I've spent more time than most with Helen. Sometimes when the mood takes me, and the wind blows through our drafty halls from the north, I offer a little prayer for the death of Agamemnon, 
I used to wish he would die in battle. But now I hope for a more ignominious end for the man. A falling rock, perhaps. Or a rabid dog. You couldn't keep feigning the madness in the circumstances, I understand that. To protect your son, our child, you had to stop. And in so doing, reveal the truth. And though I wept to see you sail away the following morning, I felt sure you would be home again before the end of the year. How many moons can it take to track down an unfaithful wife after all? First the day is dragged by, then the months, then the seasons, and finally the years. Ten years now, and still Menelaus can neither persuade his wife to come back home, nor accept that he is a red-faced boar and find himself a new wife, one less exacting than Helen. I guess I was inspired to write A Thousand Ships because I had been reading the story of the Trojan War since I was, I'm going to say 16, I think, um, as, as my GCSE Greek set text. And for a really long time, I had thought that the story could be told from a completely different perspective. You could tell the story of the war from women's perspectives, not one, not one family, not one household, but all of the women. I wanted to tell a women's epic. Um, I think it's really rare to read epic stories um, about women because we tend to think that women are domestic. That's where their stories belong and men go off and have adventures and I was certain that the war could be framed differently and actually that lots of ancient authors had framed it very differently. Um, Ovid's Heroides, uh, a bunch of those are from women waiting for their menfolk or embroiled in some other way in the Trojan War. Um, plenty of Euripides plays focus on the women of the Trojan War. In fact, seven of his eight plays that survived to us today, tragedies that survived to us today about the Trojan War, have women as the title characters. So I knew you could tell the story of the war from the women's perspective and, and, make, and give it this huge epic scale. And I really wanted to do that. I'm not gonna say it wasn't quite ambitious, because it was. I'm pretty sure I tripped up when I thought of it, because I was walking home. And I was like, no, don't do that. And I was like, no, I've got to, that's it. It's just gonna be big. The research process for A Thousand Ships has taken um, my whole life up till now, pretty well. Um, from when I started studying Greek uh, and Latin before it, I guess, at school, um, right the way up to now. Um, it involved reading enormous quantities of texts, um, some plays and poetry and fragments and, you know, inscriptions and all kinds of things. But it also involved uh, coming here, coming to the British Museum, uh, who are very sweetly letting us film here today, um, to find artwork uh, in particular that made me think of and imagine the stories that I wanted. So, for example, in A Thousand Ships, Laodomir, who is uh, one of the Greek women waiting for her husband, Protesilaus, to come home from the war. She has a vision before he goes that he'll be the first of the Greeks to land at Troy. That's what his name means, Protesilaus. means the first of the people. He is the first one to land. And she has this vision of him um, kind of balanced. His beautiful feet, she loves his feet, uh, are balanced on the prow of the ship and he's ready to, his, his toes are tensed, he's ready to jump onto the uh, Trojan shore where he'll fight and I'm afraid lose uh, to Hector, the great Trojan defender. And the vision that she sees is a statue which the British Museum holds. And so his beautiful body, his beautiful feet, I just stole them. I stole them from a statue. My imagination is just not that specifically pervy. <laughs> I just wanted that. Um, the earrings that Thetis has given on her wedding day, they're also here. They're massive. You think no normal human person could wear those. They, are, they would be too big for Pat Butcher in EastEnders. No, no, no. But they would be the right size for a goddess, right, or a sea nymph, because they're bigger than us. Ovid tells us so. And Penthesilea, the great Amazon warrior queen, um, her whole outfit was taken um, from a very, very beautiful vase of Achilles and Penthesilea um, fighting. Uh, outside Troy, on the plains outside Troy, and her, everything she's wearing, I, I took entirely from that vase. My writing process is um, 
It's a, you know what, it's all right. I'm quite disciplined. So every morning I go for a run or a walk or kickboxing and then every afternoon I sit at my desk and I write until the words are done. And ideally that's a thousand words, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, sometimes because I have other work to do and sometimes because you just stare at the screen and the words won't come. And that's not, that's not always for lack of trying or because it's, it's not a sign. You're not in the wrong bit writing the wrong thing. Sometimes it just is how it is. If you have a lot of days like that, then there's a problem. If you have one day like that, it's all right. And generally, my writing process is, I've kind of snatched the day out of the touring schedule because I spend, I usually do about between 50 and 100 shows a year. And obviously that went slightly less well during lockdown. <laughs> so um, I kind of, I, I've, I've always thought if I was just at home for a really long block of time, I'd be able to kind of rest more and get more done and that would be really better for my writing. And actually, I'm, I'm not sure it's true. I edited the next book, Pandora's Jar, as we were going into lockdown. So, I, and you know, gigs closed before lockdown happened. And so I could do kind of critical thought, but I'm not sure I've been especially creative during lockdown. Um, I'm hoping that as the world opens up again, my creative brain will move back into gear, not least because I owe another novel, so I should really get started. It will be fine. I really love that, uh, the idea that Natalie owed, owes another novel. We all owe other novels. Um, they were both uh, beautiful readings from Indira Varma and from Anne-Marie Duff and fantastic films. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, readers all over the world, uh, could you welcome to the screens Natalie Haynes and Maggie O'Farrell, who have been lurking, listening to each other. Welcome Hello. both of you. Hello, how lovely, lovely to see you. So many, so many things uh, to talk about. I mean, the first one, and please both of you jump in on this, so marked in your films that something that you had done at school or read at school, Hamlet, studying Greek, had been burning in you for these stories for such a long time. So for both of you, I'd be very interested to know, you know, Maggie, why, why this book now, given you'd been thinking about it? And then Natalie, also, you've written before in this area, but what was it about now that made this book the right time for both of you? Maggie, maybe you start. I was very struck actually by that. When I heard Natalie talking about her Dieter Classic CCSE, it is, it's, it's an interesting link between the two books. I don't know, I mean, it's funny, I don't know whether, you know, uh, sort of hitting your 40s or your mid 40s, late 40s at now in, there is a kind of sense of perspective or you get a kind of long lens, I think, on your youth, in a sense. I find myself, particularly, you know, my son is obviously is, is a teenager now. And again, it makes me think a lot about my teenage years and what it was like and how those kind of characteristics and the sort of uh, interests and flames that were sort of ignited in you by certain things that you read or you were told, um, how they can live, you know, how they continue all the way through your adult life. So... Perhaps it was that, I don't know, it just felt like the right time. It was one of those books I thought, well, I either write it now or I forget all about it. You know, I'd been thinking about it for a long time and I had, had made several attempts and I'd kind of swerved away and written, I think I've written three other books instead of writing Hamlet. Um, what about you, Natalie? Um, I think for me it was, uh, I, I mean, I pretty much only write about Greeks, really. I'm, I'm completely shameless. It's like, well, these stories <laughs> are right there and I love them and most people don't get to study them at school. And so I kind of, and I've wanted to reframe them as, as feminist readings for a, a really long time. And I'd done that twice, one with a contemporary novel, The Amber Fury, and one with a um, ancient world set novel, Children of Jocasta. But both of those were essentially tragedies. They were my retellings of, in the first case, the Oresteia, and in the second case, um, a, a bunch of plays, Sophocles and Euripides, um, about the House of Thebes. And then with this one, with Ships, what I really wanted to do was write an epic. And I was em embarrassingly far through before I realised that was the case. <laughs> it was all I can tell you. I was like, I'm going to tell the story of the Trojan War and it'll be awesome. And I'll steal a bit from the Iliad and I'll look at the Odyssey and I'm going to try and tell the story this way. And I'm going to have Euripides, Trojan women running through it. And then I'll also be able to do the Hecabe, which I've written my dissertation on along with Medea. And then this and then this. And the timelines will run forwards in terms of consequences and backwards in terms of uh, causation and that's just going to be great and then I was probably 60,000 words through before I was like, oh here we go <laughs> I'm actually trying to write an epic and I think if I thought of it sooner I would have 
put myself off. You know, I think that's often the way with me. I have to kind of sneak up on the thing that I'm trying to do because otherwise I would just look and go, well, obviously I don't know how to do that. Don't be ridiculous. And I, I, I snuck up on myself uh, because- I, I love the idea of you kind of ambushing the story. Yeah, you know, you know, I know. Exactly that. Um, th Thank goodness it's a war narrative or that might not have been appropriate. <laughs> no, and a war narrative is not as good as an epic, you know, an epic. Correct. We, we understand that. Um, you both talked, I mean, Natalie, you were filming it in the British Museum who very kindly let you in and us in. To I do love them. them so. They were so wonderful. And Maggie, you were in your beautiful physic garden, your herb garden. Um, it suggests that for both of you, the physical objects of the time, the, the thing that the great Neil McGregor always calls the charisma of things, is very important to getting under the skin of the writing and the characters. Is, is that true? I mean, Maggie, with your falconry, you know, I had to do taxidermy. Let me tell you, that was not the best of my life. <laughs> um, I would have preferred a live bird, shall we say. But, you know, just... just why did you know that you needed to feel what it was like for the bird to land on your arm and build the garden and then now well it was fine because I, I, I actually wrote a scene um where she is flying her kestrel and i chose a kestrel because that's a bird i've been really um sort of slightly obsessed by since i was a child and i wrote a scene and i had <laughs> i had a description where um she's holding out her glove and the kestrel lands with a thud on the glove and then I actually went and flew a kestrel. And actually, a kestrel is a tiny bird. I mean, it's probably lighter than a kitten. And I was standing holding the thing. And the kestrel actually landed on me before I even realized it had taken flight. <laughs> and it was already eating the headless, you know, dead chick that I was holding in my glove. And so, you know, that's why, that's why you need to do these things. Because, you know, I last flew a kestrel when I was a child and it probably did feel like a thud, but as a grown adult woman, it lands and it's so swift and it's so silent and it's this incredible experience. It just appears, it's almost like magic, this kind of materializing of this creature of the air, which is so extraordinary. So that's why you need to do it. So I went back and completely <laughs> rewrote the scene because the sensation of it is so specific and you have to know that really to write it. Yes, because if people, people who know what it feels like, a t tiny details like that for those of us who write historical fiction, when those details are wrong, yeah. And the integrity of the whole narrative falls to be. You get, you get pulled out of it instantly and think, I, know, I, I don't believe a word of this. Yeah. But Natalie, for you, you were wonderfully vivid about uh, describing the things that you were imagining. And, you know, feet was not the thing I was expecting you to say. When you <laughs> that statue, let me tell you. Um, but it, it, in that sort of sense, there, there is a lot of visual evidence, if you like, of your period. And does that make a, a difference in terms of you look at a statue like that and you think yes he's my version of that character. yes my version yeah yeah no absolutely and sometimes there just isn't very much evidence for somebody so some of the more obscure kind of older goddesses the kind of pre olympus goddesses like gaia or themis who's the goddess of divine order there's just not very very much imagery of them there aren't very many images of them that have survived particularly well to the present day so actually it's a lot more of a kind of it took it took much more of an effort to i mean the the gaia chapter is about I'm not sure it's even two paragraphs. It's really, really short. It's right near the end of the novel and the kind of weight of the world literally is, is weighing too heavily on Gaia's shoulders. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I went into that chapter expecting to have lots of detail, which I'd done with so many of the goddesses before. And I thought, I, I don't think she, she's, she's the world. We all know who she is. And so the, the sort of crucial moments I would pull back and think, no, actually more detail than this isn't, isn't quite helpful it, it becomes like look at all the things I found out here you are here you are it's like no that's actually not going to make the novel a better novel I've got to kind of stop at this point point. and so every now and then but I am an absolute monster for what's in video gaming parlance known as easter eggs if you are a massive classics nerd this novel is is packed <laughs> with little secrets here you are this is for you moments so yeah no I'm in fan service armor. Yeah, that's exactly. what they call it fan service. Yeah. Let's call it that. Yeah, let's, let's, call it that, let's go with that and yeah, we'll go, we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, Maggie, when uh, both, both in the reading, but um, in your film, you highlighted this fact that for, for most people who are parents or carers of children, the idea of a death of a child is the worst thing that can be imagined and that you needed to put it off. That idea that till your boy had tipped over that that age you know it's not 1596 but it was 2000 and whatever tipped over did you always have a sense of how you were going to start and how you were going to tell the story because of course it's his his twin 
that we meet first. And of course, Agnes is very, very important, you know, Shakespeare's wife, you know, you've animated all of that. So did you have an idea before you started how you were going to get into the story of the death of the child? Or did that come in the writing as you did it? Well, I think, I think like most other books, I think you often start, I don't know if Natalie and Kate, you're the same, but I often start with an idea and I think this is a book and it's going to start at A and then we're going to travel all the way to B. But actually often in the writing of it, or sometimes in the research stage, you find it actually, uh, it, it sort of takes on its own momentum and it, um, you know, and it sort of sudden, suddenly it takes a kind of right hand turn and it says actually no, we're going to end up at C or we're going to end up at D. But for me that's always a really, I don't know, it's always a really positive sign anyway actually because I think that's the moment at which this narrative or this book or this fictional world is kind of acquiring a pulse, it's acquiring a life of its own. And so I did, I mean, but I, with this book I did roughly know, I knew that we were going to start with the twins and they were going to get ill. And of course, you mean, when you think about, you know, this is a book which is based on real people. So there is an inevitable moment where, of course, you know, Hamlet is going to die, unfortunately, because, you know, that is a fact and we can't get around that. But I always knew it would end with the play, because I think one of the biggest questions in my mind, um, having thought about the link between this dead, lost child and this play with very much the same name, um, is I always wondered how... Hamlet's mother felt about it. I don't know if I would have been thrilled if my husband wrote a play called after our dead son. And I always wondered, I wonder how, I wonder if he asked her, I wonder if she knew, I wonder how she felt about that. And so in a sense, the novel was me mining that question and trying to answer that question for myself. I mean, and, and Natalie, I mean, what you both do, you do it beautifully. But Natalie, one of the things that I think is so amazing in A Thousand Ships is, it very much shines a spotlight, uh, as Maggie's just said, on the stories we choose to tell and who gets to tell them. Yes, you know? absolutely. Yeah, and that seems to me very fundamental to, to your epic. It's, it could always have been told the other way around from the women, but it never had been. It just could. And sometimes the, you know, sometimes we had a more female-centric version of the story and it got lost, you know. There was once an epic poem that went after the Iliad called the Ethiopus, which told the story of Memnon, the great Ethiopian prince to fight at Troy, and also Penthesilea, the great Amazon warrior queen, and it's lost. And it's like, my subject stands accused so often of being pale, male, and stale. It's like, well, thank goodness we lost the epic poem with the black guy and the woman in it, because otherwise that might have been annoying. Um, and, you know, and sometimes we do have a poem which focuses on um, a female character. Uh, Quintus Manaeus's Fall of Troy is not very frequently read. I'm not going to lie to you. But that he, he presents Penthesilea in this explicitly heroic way. And yet I managed to get through an entire degree in classics without ever kind of coming across it in that, in that process. It's like, well, who decided somewhere along the line that, you know, Ovid's Metamorphoses is a great and important text, which it is, but the Ovid's Heroides, the set of letters from abandoned women of Greek myth, many of whom are part of the Trojan cycle, but that somehow isn't such a great text. It is. How dare you? Shut up. So it was really an attempt to kind of say these, these pieces of this story are important too. And sometimes this bit of the story has been lost so much that I'm going to have to build it pretty much from scratch. There's just like half a sentence in a fragment somewhere. It's like, well, then that is what I'm going to do. It's unacceptable to me that this story only exists that way around now. I can, it's within my power to change that and that's what I'm going to do. And, and of course, that's, that's the power of being a novelist. You're both beautiful novelists. You're not historians, that's not the point. Um, one of the things before we go to the audience questions, because there are many, many, many coming in, um, but I think both novels again, I mean, they are so, so different, but there are things that they have in common. The structure, of Hamlet is just extraordinary, Maggie. You know, as a fellow novelist, the, the hat is doffed. Um, and with Natalie, you have these sort of, not fragmentary ways of telling, but it seems to me to mirror classic text, the idea of the different voices coming through. And you both do this thing of it being entirely of its period, but yet also modern in the nature of language and the line and the simplicity. So I wonder if you could just both say a little bit about how you structured your novels and, and why, did, you know, did they start in the place that they've ended up or did you try them in different ways? Maggie, if you could start on that. Well, actually, I, I, tried, uh, I tried to write it, a version of it, um, which started much too near the end. And then I had about 20,000 words. And when I decided I was gonna actually 
properly address and write this book. I read it and I thought, no, this is all wrong. <laughs> so I completely started again. And I thought, no, we have to start, you know, just a week away or a week or so away from his death. You know, we've got to have that run up. Um, but, you know, the structure, the structure is always a, an elusive thing for me. I think it's something that partly you decide and partly a book will assume the shape it needs to be in a way as well. Sometimes you have to sort of allow it to fill the space it needs to, in a sense, a bit like water. You can't really contain it. You've just got to wait and it will find its level. Um, but yeah, so, so I think, I think partly you have to just try it and see what happens. That's, that's, yeah. my, that's, my, <laughs> that's my very badly thought out theory about structure. No, but I mean, that, that makes sense. And the, the sense that once you're writing it and you found the shape, it's like mm. breathing life into it. It becomes a 3D yeah. thing as opposed to a flat thing. Yeah. And, and Natalie, is, is that a bit the case that you kind of actively mirrored the kind of more classical form of, t of storytelling? I mean, honestly, I knew the shape of this book the day that I thought that I would write this book. Did you? Um, so all the kind of, the way that it has ended up having that kind of fragmentary quality, that happened over time as I was writing it, but I always knew, literally the first day that I thought of it, I thought I'm gonna tell the story of the Trojan War, but I'm only gonna tell it from the women's perspectives. And then I thought, can I tell it from all of their perspectives? And as it turned out, the answer was no, there are too many, um, which is in itself, freaking awesome, by the way. Um, and then I thought, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna have a present tense timeline in the book, or virtually present tense, which is the Trojan Women by Euripides. And then I'm going to tell the, how, but, and they're going to stand on the shore and they're going to say, but how did we get to here? Could we have stopped it yesterday? Could we have stopped it the day before, the week before, the month before? Obviously allowing for the fact that time in those terms doesn't exist at that point, but let's not go down that uh, rabbit hole again, or I will cry long, endless tears about how hard yeah, it is no to discuss time, time in the ancient world. Um, <laughs> But, and also food, please invent food sooner. Um, but I thought I'm going to tell that backwards because I think that's what you do. When could we have fixed it? Well, when could we have fixed it? Well, when, but how about if that didn't work, then when could we, when could we, when could we? I think that if only sense, which is so integral to tragedy, I thought I can bring that into epic and it will work. And the consequences timeline, I knew I wanted to follow the stories of these women out in all these different directions. The Greeks, the Trojans, as, the, the, as they leave Troy, are taken from Troy, enslaved. Um, and also the Greek women waiting for their husbands at home. And then I thought, well, how am I going to cut into that? You know, the, the letters from Penelope, which I was so sure I wanted to do that. I wanted the Odyssey to overlie my, my kind of idea of how to retell the Iliad. Um, so it was always massively complicated and it did occasionally make me, you know, when you've got bits of index card everywhere with people's names and they're in different colors to tell you whether in the past in terms of the book or the present or the future. And then you think I've got them all out on the floor and I need to make sure that nothing's gonna kind of touch itself because otherwise that'll be, and then you look at it and think if I tied string between these, I would be a serial killer in any film about serial killers. That's the only thing that's missing. And that was quite a harrowing moment. But then once I got through that, I was like, well, you are killing quite a lot of people in this book. No, like, yeah, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it, it's just fine. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of death, a lot of death. There, there is no doubt, but you know, serial killer, no, no. Right, we, we have loads and loads of questions. So maybe if you just answer one each and we'll keep moving through, um, that might be easier if, if you try to answer both of you, all of them, we will not be off this till tomorrow, uh, much as I think everybody would like to hear. Um, so Sue Hat says, you've both written historical novels about historical events. How constraining is that, that the narrative is set in place? Maggie, maybe you could take that one. I didn't find it constraining at all. I mean, the thing about, you know, the Shakespeare story is, as I, I think I said in the film, there are so many enormous gaps. And, you know, if you think that we know little about Shakespeare, what we know about his wife and his children is, is so scant, you know, that we just have a couple of records in the Stratford upon Avon parish registers. We know about their births, we know about their deaths, we know about their marriages, but that's it. But in a sense, those kind of huge vacuums or longueurs are are a kind of opportunity for a, a writer of fiction because you know you can rush forward and fill the gaps you know what I really tried to do was to not go against any kind of known fact I tried to use whatever is, is kind of definitely known about these people and I tried to a bit like Natalie you know <laughs> tying her string between them you know you, you try and fill in the fill in the dots but in a sense that you know sort of join the dots but in a sense I found that hugely stimulating actually and, and quite a sort of opportunity for creation so I loved it actually I thought it was great Great way to work. Question from Tim Rideout um, is, 
given the bizarre nature of current times, <laughs> um, do we need the perspective that only historical fiction can give us in order to say something about now? Natalie. Uh, I think it helps. I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I wrote, I wrote my plague novel a book ago, Children of Jocasta is my plague yes. novel, um, because obviously that's set in Thebes when plague comes. So like Maggie, I'd had the um, not entirely desirable experience of imagining a plague. <laughs> and watch it, go, oh, great. It's just like, I, no, wait, not great. Uh, bad, bad. <laughs> but it's just like I thought, no, stop. Um, and so, you know, that was less than ideal. But yeah, I think um, the, the sense of, I think maybe the, the sense of being able to escape into the past for readers, um, you don't, I, I don't think I entirely felt that as a writer because I, I felt like I had to be too in control um, of, of the kind of material. So I was always like, no, I'm here. I can't afford to dive into this book and get lost because I'll end up like uh, Arnold of Toady in the Box of Delights. I'll get stuck there and I'll just be sitting on the shores of Troy shouting balefully at people that... Greeks don't have shadows, or maybe English don't have shadows, I can't remember. Uh, he is mad at that point. So I was trying really hard to retain uh, a sense of self while I was writing it, but there's no way around it. Um, giving house room to so very many women um, who have been brutalized in so very many different ways was an intensely traumatic experience um, to, to sustain over months at a time. And I'm, I'm kind of delighted that this, this book nearly destroyed me, Kate, you know that. Uh, and, and now it's kind of pulled me through this year when everything has felt so fragile. And so I have a, a very strange emotional response to this book, I guess. But as far as I can tell from readers, um, the escapism that it offers them, even though that escapism is sometimes to a world which is far more brutal than ours rather than less, um, it seems to be working for them, which is a kind of wonderful, unexpected thing to have. Yeah, because maybe, you know, some Sometimes I think in historical fiction um, that the huge emotions that we're feeling sometimes with the benefit of hindsight or space of a hundred years, you can still experience those emotions, but with less, um, less pain, maybe. I don't know, Maggie, do you want to quickly come in on that? Because you, you did mention that about, you know, what it feels like um, that suddenly you did know how a pandemic could travel from place to place. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've, I found the last six months, I feel in a sense, a stronger sense of connection with the characters I finished writing about over a year ago, which is an odd experience. I don't think I've ever had that actually with a novel. You know, usually when you, you do the final sort of copy edit and you, that's, that's your involvement in the book and, and it's, you're sort of shut out of it in a sense after that. But with certainly having finished Hamlet and then, um, you know, the crisis that's gripped the world since then, it, it has, it's really altered my my feelings towards the book, it's also my relationship with the book, which is, which is a strange one. That's never happened before. Yeah, amazing. Um, question from Simon Savage, who you will both know. Hello, Simon. Um, he Hello. says, it seems both of your novels are passion projects um, that have been lingering in your minds for some long time. Um, how did you feel at the first moment of writing and how do you feel now they're done, given they've been in your hearts such a long time? I found it. I found it very hard um, to say goodbye, actually, to the characters in this book. I think because I think because I, it, it took me so long to get to write about them. And usually, when I have finished a book, it takes after about a month or so. I take down everything on my pin board, the photographs and the plans and the diagrams and uh, post its. But actually, that took me almost a year to do it with Hamlet. So that just <laughs> shows how how much I missed them in a way. Yeah. 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 Natalie? Yeah, that's, it's a really good question, um, as I would expect, obviously, from Simon, who always asks brilliant questions. I, I missed them terribly um, mm -hmm. when I finished writing. And everyone, my mom said when she first read it, everyone will think you're Penelope, they'll never realize you're Cassandra. And I said, well, of course, you're all of them. <laughs> that's the thing with writing a novel. They're all you, even the villains are you, even the people who murder children are you. Unfortunately, they're all you. But I, um, I do. She was absolutely right. Of course, that's who I miss the most is, is the woman everyone thinks is crazy, but is actually completely sane. And I miss them terribly. And I'm very lucky because, um, because I have the radio show, I get to tour a live version of that, to, which I write to tie in with each book. So I performed, I don't know, even before lockdown began, I'd done something like 70 or 75 shows 
for ships all over the world. And so I talked about these women. I carry them around for like an extra year. Long after the writing is finished, I get to take them with me. And it's just delightful. And this is my, <laughs> I'm going to cry. This is my last event for ships today. And it's fine because the Pandora Pantechnicon will roll into town in two weeks. And then I'll be all about those women. And I'll be like, yeah, I don't have time. I don't have time for those women anymore. <laughs> but, yeah, that my heart is it, it dent, it's a little dented at the thought of we being without very them. honoured that this is the last one for the Women's Prize. That so is a I. fantastic thing. More than you could possibly know. <laughs> so for, um, for you, Maggie, Jane North says she loves your reimagining or reclaiming of Agnes as an unconformist and independent woman. Have you received any criticism about this from more orthodox Shakespearean quarters? <laughs> Hmm. Well, not so far, or not, <laughs> not that I know no, of. Not loudly. <laughs> <laughs> not twice, Maybe. that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not on Twitter or Facebook, so it's quite possible it's filled with vitriol and bile <laughs> towards me, but I, I, not that I know of, knowingly. The only thing actually that has, the only thing I'm aware of people writing in is that the fact that I have mentioned um, the city of Aleppo as <laughs> as a port. Several people have written to me and said, I think you'll find that Aleppo is not a port, um, which is absolutely true. But the thing is, I, I wrote it as a port. It, I wrote it as a port where a ship visits Aleppo in kind of homage to Shakespeare himself, whose geography in certain cities and towns and other countries uh, does vary. Um, so I, it is a kind of, it was a kind of deliberate mistake, but it has upset a few people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, that, that is an occupational hazard. I once wrote a description of an owl, the noise an owl made in one of my novels. Really? And I got a letter from a man telling me that he loved my novel. However, my description of the owl was, was very poor and enclosing a leaflet for the owl appreciation. <laughs> I hope, joined, I hope you joined, Kate. Um, although I, I am partial to an owl, it's got to be said. Uh, but Natalie, um, Julia Wino uh, says that she had thought with the title that she'd get to hear more of Helen's voice but we hear other women's view of her instead. Why did you not decide to put Helen so centre stage? I did, and then I had to take her out. Uh, and this Ooh. is exactly the, um, the detail of, of your question earlier about structure. I thought, I'll, it's going to be so cool getting to tell Helen's story, and I'll be able to do the bit from Odyssey 4, when Telemachus goes looking for his missing dad, Odysseus, um, and he ends up in Sparta and joins Menelaus and Helen for dinner. And... Um, and they sort of reminisce about the war. And then Menelaus starts crying when he remembers his dead comrades. And Helen doesn't say anything to anybody, but just sort of summons over her um, slave woman and gets her to bring her a bag of leaves, which she's had from her friend Polydamna in Egypt. Um, and then Homer spends 10 lines telling us about this drug, which he calls Nepenthes, grief banishing. Um, and, sh and he says, you could see your child die and you'd be fine. You could see your parents die. You wouldn't mind. So this is essentially a class A substance. And I thought this is going to be so cool because I'll be able to. And it threw the whole book off balance because it turns out it's really hard to explain to a modern audience that for the remainder of their relationship, Helen basically drugs Menelaus with Rohypnol every night. So he stops crying. It's just a really difficult, bleak bit of story. And I thought I kind of, and I wanted to, and it just didn't work. And in the end, the version of, of Helen that I sort of went with was most like the version in Euripides Trojan Women, just this sort of terrifying, ice cold badass. And I thought, I, I don't want to take her further than that. I think her story had been told so many times in so many ways. She's always refracted through the prism of the male gaze, which is obviously really annoying. But I felt like I couldn't do, I couldn't really do her better than the bit where um, they come to take her back to Menelaus. And uh, I think I've said the sun would be, should be shining in her eyes, but he doesn't dare. And I thought, that's how I feel about Helen. I don't have anything to add in the end. And I took the other scene out. That, that's that's so interesting. Maggie, did you have anything like that, a, sort of a character that uh, you felt when you started to write and were thinking about it was going to be more significant or less significant, and when it came to it, they just couldn't do what you wanted of? I'm not sure. I mean, certainly I was, I was a bit taken aback. I hadn't, I mean, when I first conceived the book, I thought it was going to be about fathers and sons, as of course the play Hamlet is. And it was also... I also planned it to be about ghosts and grief. I mean, it is about grief, obviously, but I mean, two things happened that, you know, I, I had planned it as a kind of ghost story where this family, the four of them who are left, the father and the two sisters and the mother are haunted by this little boy ghost. And actually, as I, in the writing of the book, I realized that what was 
more plausible and in a way more devastating is the fact that they are desperate to see a ghost as of course the prince of um, Denmark is at the beginning he wants to see his father's ghost and he does but in real life they don't they can't find his ghost they can't locate it and they all four of them in different ways are desperate to try and communicate you know beyond the grave with this boy but he he's nowhere he isn't there and to me that felt as though that changed in the writing of the book so I thought I would have a ghost but actually there isn't one <laughs> Yeah, and and of, and of course the, the the power of the the twins and that being so strong in the heart of it. Um, uh, a question following on from that is: um, Did you did writing Hamlet, Leslie asked, give you more insights into Hamlet as the play? Well, in a sense, I had always I think because I was told about the boy's death, Hamlet, so young, you know, when I was sixteen or whatever I was. I think in a sense, I've always seen the play through those through that lens in a sense but certainly I mean I did go back to it um, of course when I was writing the book and I reread it again and again and it was strange in a sense I it was strange reading it as an adult because obviously you know the first time I read it I was 16 and then I read it again when I was a student and um, you know it seemed to me it was it was really strange reading it because I was reading about this Prince, who when I was a, when I was a teenager seemed an act, seemed grown up, seemed an adult, and now I, I look, read Hamlet and he seems so young. You know, he seems like maybe a fifteen or a sixteen year old, and he's this sort of young adolescent who's been dragged much too soon into this terrifying adult world where the adults are behaving in an appalling, there's a variety of appalling ways. And I felt so, I felt I felt so sorry for him, you know, and I realised he's so young. You know, he's just a teenager, really. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. Their idea of when somebody was still a student was maybe not quite the same as ours. We always think of him as being thirty. <laughs> it's quite yeah, quite... there's all sorts of scholarly debate about how old Hamlet really is. Yeah, well, you know, they they that's the joy of fiction, isn't it? You know, that that you can tell the stories. Um, Natalie, um, an interesting question. This Kim Yanis says, what if any parallels can be drawn between the inner lives of women caught in the conflict with the Trojan War and modern attitudes to sex and gender in war? Um, when this book came out, uh, somebody interviewed me for, I can't remember which uh, radio station. Um, and they said, you know, how, how does it seem relevant? You know, how are you going to make this relevant to a contemporary audience? You know, what about the story is going to be relevant given that it's set in ancient Greece? I was like, dude, there is literally nothing I would like more than the idea of trafficked women <laughs> being, being taken and sold and moved across the world with no say in their lives, no agency, no control over their bodies, their children, their you know, dead husband. I, I long for it to be irrelevant. I'll come and live in your world. That sounds great. And then you can slag this book up as much as you want. I'm fine with that. But unfortunately, I live in this one. <laughs> in fact, it, you know, the, in the beginning of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, which obviously is, is quite a lot later than the Trojan War, assuming the Trojan War to be historical, which I know not everyone does. Um, he says that his uh, history being what it is, human nature being what it is, it'll, um, it'll be relevant through time he calls it a possession for all time He's, you know and and i think it, it's a it's a difficult question to ask because we don't have a language in the ancient world for issues of gender we don't we barely have a language for psychology that's why you get things like you know when you fall in love in ancient greece it's not an act of falling in love you're afflicted from the outside you know the god love fires an arrow which hits you it's like a physical pain but but the idea that you might want one thing but do another that we, there's just no language for that and there's not even language for that in the fifth century let alone way back in the 12th 13th century when the trojan war is happening so you have to allow yourself a little creative license to write a novel set in a time when people's inner monologues didn't exist so much so that they hadn't invented the novel yet um so yeah slight issue but yeah i think the i guess my point is that um I don't think people change dramatically. I think circumstances change and the world changes, but human people, they do not change. And, you know, I've been saying it for so long, it almost feels boring now, but women, they're the same thing as people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's what Joanna Trollope once said when I was interviewing her, she said, but the thing is, Kate, the human heart does not change so very Tro -tro much. is never wrong. Tro -tro is never true. wrong. Um, we've got time for one last question. Um, you both talked about these being, you know, books that have lived in with you for a long time. Uh, Natalie, you've got Pandora's Jar coming out. Yes. But the question from Celia Hickson is, do you have a bank of books that you 
are waiting to write. You know, what next, I think. Yeah, is, I've is sold two more novels. So yes, I literally do. And there are, there are literally people sitting in an office tapping their fingers with a sort of increasingly sinister stare. And I deserve that because I'll definitely be, I definitely won't be late. Um, <laughs> So next up for me is Medusa. Um, I wrote uh, Pandora's Jar is a book of nonfiction. So I look at the lives of 10 women in myth and how they've changed through um, time and uh, art and opera in the case of Eurydice, for example. So that's been a, a lovely kind of emotional time off because I've got to just do research, but I haven't had to actually imagine what it's like to have your you know, infant child ripped from your arms and thrown against some rocks and so on and so on. So it's been a bit nicer. So yeah, I, I'm about to go back into the you know, gloomy abyss, I suppose, to write Medusa. And then after that comes Medea. So the next couple of years for me is, uh, being turned into a monster and then killing children. I, it's just very hard to see a downside to this. From my and, and, we, and you've said all of this and you even included Pat Butcher earlier. So, I mean, this, this, this Zoom High call art, low art, always everything. the way with me. <laughs> Maggie, what about you? But, you know, this has been such an extraordinary novel and you published it, you know, in the middle of lockdown. Um, <laughs> are you thinking of what you're writing next or are you actually just trying to enjoy this achievement? Uh, no, I started writing another book. I, I, I can't really. I can't really so write, good. I can't really not write a book. Um, and but I'm very superstitious uh, talking about things I haven't finished. So all I can say is that it's set in the past, which doesn't leave it quite wide open. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that, nobody's going to challenge you on that because that could actually be something set yesterday. Everything will exactly. be the place by the time we get there. I um, think we're all disappointed to find out it's not set on a spaceship, Maggie. That's all. I, I know. Have. Next time, you never know. I you mean, never know. Way to sell your fans short. That's. I all know, I but can I just say there have been spaceships in the past, Natalie? I mean, you know, this is this is all going to degenerate. Um, you've both been absolutely wonderful uh, to come and join us this evening. Um, it's been fantastic um, to you, the audience, uh, seeing so many questions. We would, of course, rather be in the real world together. We would rather be raising a glass to celebrate the six extraordinary novels on this year's shortlist um, and be able to be in the shared space. And you would then have your book signed. Uh, but it is a wonderful thing that thanks to technology, people from all over the world can engage with the prize. And the one aim about the prize has always been reach out to as many readers as possible and make sure that everybody who wants to engage can do so. Uh, so thank you all for your questions and for bringing that spirit to this. Um, a huge thank you to our sponsors, uh, Nat West Baileys and Fremantle. And I will be back uh, tomorrow night uh, with Jenny Offal and Bernadine Evaristo. Uh, the last two, but not the least, of course, we've scrambled them all up. You will notice nobody's been in alphabetical order or anything like that. Uh, to have the last two uh, readings and films for the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist. Go on the website, do join in, do send your comments. But for now, mm -hmm. an enormous thank you to Natalie Haynes and to Maggie O'Farrell and to you, the audience, and the whole Women's Prize mm -hmm. team who've made this so seamless. Good night, everybody, and see some of you, all of you, more of you, tomorrow. Good night. Thank you. Good thank night. You, Kate. Thank Bye. you, Kate. Bye. Good night. Good night.